Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us at 10 p.m. on a Friday night to talk about age verification. I am so excited that you are so excited about this topic. <laughs> uh, we're going to run this one a little loose and informal. Um, I'm Leah. Use they or she pronouns. I'm Campaigns and Comms Director with Fight for the Future, which is a queer women and artist-led uh, national digital human rights organization. Uh, Starchy, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, I'm Starchy Grant, he, him. I work on the tech ops team at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And every now and then they let me out of the server room to do something fun like this. How do we even want to start? Um, so we have a, a topic statement here. Uh, we have age verification laws that have been enacted already in eight states in this uh, this beautiful country. Uh, to protect the children. Finally, somebody thought of the children. Nobody ever thinks of the children. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what what we've seen happen is uh, instead of really seeing any effective age verification mechanisms on uh, on these adult websites, we've seen the best known of them. Uh, restrict access to the states in question, and the lesser known do nothing at all. Uh, I think uh, this this is probably having some interesting effects. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, so for the past, it feels like all of our lives, but really I think it's been about a year or so, my organization has been very heavily involved in lobbying against a federal bill that would that includes an age verification component called COSA, which is the Kids Online Safety Act. Uh, and what that bill essentially does is say that for uh, minors online, uh, platforms have a duty of care to make sure that there's nothing uh, that nothing that affects the mental health of children uh, will be shown to them if it affects them in a negative way. Uh, this is extremely broad uh, and highly open to interpretation, first by the arbiters of the law that were selected by its sponsors, state attorney generals, um, and then due to pressure from organizations like mine, uh, EFF, ACLU, and a absolutely ravenous discord full of queer kids <laughs> who are the true heroes in this story in every way possible never fuck with a discord full of queer kids I, I, yeah yeah it's uh i can't i i don't have words for <laughs> for, the, for these folks they're incredible uh they decided to roll back the duty of care to uh now the uh the executive branch essentially which for um the Democratic co-sponsors of this bill seemed fine because, you know, there's not an election about to happen. And for the Republicans seemed probably fine because there was an election about to happen. <laughs> it seems that uh, very few people, no matter what they don't want censored online, can think very far past four years. Um, and this this bill, of course, by its mechanism of saying that you need to content filter for minors uh, require some sort of age verification so that you can decide who is a minor. Uh, and that is problematic for very, very many reasons. Uh, uh, not, the le not the least of which is the, the idea that um, many people who aren't minors could get swept up in the dragnet of, uh, and then on top of that, everybody essentially with the age verification options that are on the table these days loses their right to privacy if they would like to see any sort of content that may be affecting the mental health of minors online and just to name that that's everything from information on climate change to information on guns to information on gun safety to reproductive health care to any sort of queer content to uh, resources for supporting people who are being bullied, resources for supporting people with eating disorders or any of these harms that are uh, 
pointed to by the bill's proponents, some of which are parents who have had horrific uh experiences with what's gone on with their kids and you know our sympathy goes out to them but uh this bill is just not a very good idea and uh and just to give the the short of it cosa's a uh, continually resurrecting corpse bill uh <laughs> right now it's 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 in the hammered into the coffin stage but you know those 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 nails corrode um and then the thing rises again uh <laughs> so that's like our big in on age verification we occasionally talk to um state media about various bills that are being passed that are proposed for um for various age verification regimes in, in different states uh and we are also one of the organizations that isn't afraid to uh to work directly with sex workers and to center them and our sort of work and 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 everything that we do because they are some of the most uh traditionally undervalued people on line <laughs> in our society and uh and and they've really borne the brunt of bad internet legislation in terms of their their lives and their safety over the past ser several years um yeah yeah, uh, I, I think that that's one of the really interesting parallels that I've drawn from this push is uh, the, the effect on uh, sex workers and on other people that these bills are intending to, uh, at least on the surface, to protect. And maybe the bills are totally well-intentioned, although uh, when we hear Marsha Blackburn, one of the co-sponsors of COSA, say that she wants to protect children from the transgender in our society, I personally have trouble uh, accepting that as a positive intention. Um, the uh, some of the the effects of these bills are uh, you know already on the state level when we see uh, sites like Pornhub uh, shut down in Texas. Does anybody here live in Texas or another site another state where these these laws have gone into effect? A lot of people. Great, uh, Arkansas. Yeah, so a, a lot of people in the room, um, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you look at porn, but I don't need to see everybody's hand. Uh, it's fine. A, a lot of times what happens, some people uh, just start using a VPN. Great, that's fine. Um, some people are not that savvy. Uh, some people are just lazy, right? Maybe you have a VPN installed, but you also have access to Google. And there's another site uh, in search results, three results down, uh, and that'll get you what you want. Um, it's also going to get you a lot of other stuff, which is pretty awful, right? Um, now, I, I, I'm not personally of the opinion that ALO, the uh, the company that owns Pornhub, is necessarily the greatest people in the world but they've been in the spotlight for a long time. Uh, they've built up a, a really good trust and safety team out of necessity. Uh, they're pretty good at proactively taking down all the worst stuff that people try to put on there. Uh, stuff like child sexual abuse material, deep fakes, uh, anything non-consensual that hopefully everybody in this room would agree we don't really want to see um, and is harmful to the people depicted. A lot of the other sites in those search results don't do anything like that. And they're often not hosted in the US. They are not going to uh, be easily targeted by the penalties uh, included in these laws. So when people are pushed down to those alternatives, uh, it really creates a lot of harm for everyone except for the, the people running those sites. Um, we saw a lot of similar things happen back in, I want to say, 2017, uh, when SESTA FOSTA was, uh, when that legislation was passed. Mm -hmm. um, the, the intent was, again, I think very well intentioned to protect victims of sex trafficking. Uh, the result was that sex workers, uh, and, and even, even people trying to arrange uh, consensual non-paid sex uh, online 
had to take those interactions either to quote unquote the dump or uh, meet offline on the streets. Uh, and this makes everybody involved less safe and in fact makes investigators jobs harder when they are trying to find people carrying out human trafficking. Uh, so that, uh, that I don't know if you have to say yeah, that. Yeah, uh, a couple more ripple effects of SESTA-FOSTA, I guess, that we should probably touch on. Well, I mean, SESTA-FOSTA is the law that we point to over and over again with um, any with, with, with these sort of censorship-focused, restriction-focused bills. There was one recently, like, I have this vision in my head of these really badass sex workers who showed up in Oakland um, in front of City Hall in the middle of the 2020 wildfires when the air quality was terrible to take pictures and hold a protest to, to try to get the fact that this there was another bill like like sesta fossa even to make it even worse called the Earn It Act, which is a content um, and message scanning bill um that would break encryption across the board uh and uh and and these state laws too it just with 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 earn it with these state laws we see what happens when you try to do this and it's it's a fundamental disconnect between what you want a law to do and how the internet actually works uh and it and over and over again advocates and and since sesta fossa the sex worker community has become some of the most badass networked unrelenting smart organizers that um that we work with that they're, they're one of our favorite communities of all time they're up there they're up there with with the queer kids on the discord <laughs> uh, in terms of like our favorites because they've got it together and they know that they're fighting for their lives um in the same way that the the queer kids on the discord know that they're they're fighting for their lives and for the lives of their friends and the access to the the um the life-saving resources that they they need online to feel a sense of belonging especially if they live in a community that's not welcoming to them so unintended consequences of uh sesta fosta continued uh sesta fosta also created this criminal uh, or this 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 additional pen penalty or this ex additional perception of liability for anybody who assists a sex worker, any per person or corporation or what have you. And what that's done in a practical sense has led to mass deplatforming of anybody who might be construed to be a sex worker, to be involved with sex workers. And I feel like to the point where like, even as I'm talking to you about this community um, of which I'm not a member, <laughs> but the fact that like I do advocacy work for them, eventually some al risk management algorithm may scan this video as it sits on the Electronic Frontiers Forum website and uh, and decide that I am too closely affiliated with helping sex workers under this law and that I should be denied a bank account or have my DoorDash account canceled or be booted off of PayPal or 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 any sorts any sort of thing like that um as the the liability field and like AI supercharged data broker fueled like risk management assessments just get more and more and more constrictive and more and more and more punishing of anybody who steps outside of the norm um which is right now the lived experience of of many sex workers is that they just can't access the normal resources to like have somewhere to live to like buy their groceries with a bank account or uh or anything like this under this law that was originally intended to um protect victims of trafficking uh, when in reality, what it did was disempower anybody affiliated with that sort of work to the point that it makes them more vulnerable, puts them more in danger, and um, and as many advocates say, has cost lives. So these age verification bills are more of the same, um, and and a really uh, in a fundamentally disturbing way. They're they're a way for legislators to say oh we're think we're thinking of the kids look at this big win that we passed 
for the kids uh, when really that sort of censorship and the way that the internet works, it'll just stream right around um, and, 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 and increase the harm and, and force, force more people into, into the dark, as it were. Um, Starchy and I agreed at the beginning of this, neither of us said it, that we're just two people up here. If anybody wants to like ask a question or has a statement or wants us to go a certain way, just come up to the mic at any point. <laughs> yeah. Feel free please, please. To, to join the panel do, um, do not worry about interrupting my ramblings uh yeah so you want to talk about let's talk about like the practical like privacy impacts a little bit well, yeah um so um or, or we have a question let's, let's yeah why don't you hit this us. question yeah. first do you think that could also be used to target journalism where they could argue something like a new story police brutality or a type of uh or war would be something uh did you hear my question yeah i did so you're asking if age verification laws could be used to target journalism i think something like cosa definitely could in terms of because that's like talking about negatively affecting mental health and um just hell of a lot of stuff that happens in this world that negatively <laughs> affects the mental health of us all not to mention minors so um yeah i mean age verification law specifically like what's happening in the states what do you think Starchy? yeah um so i, I mean, to be clear i'm not a lawyer um and, and uh, Me either uh, not not familiar with the the text of the existing bills uh in in that level of detail uh but yes that kind of scope creep is a big concern to be sure um using the existing mechanisms of censorship and surveillance which to be perfectly clear um preventing even just minors from viewing pornographic material whether or not you agree that that's a good thing to do is a form of censorship and checking people's age before they view pornographic material whether or not you agree that that's a good thing to do is a form of surveillance um so you might think that those are good intentions, but it is very easy for that scope to creep. And as you suggest, uh, to take those mechanisms once they're in place and apply them to other topics as well. And th that is a big concern for me. Yeah. Okay. I can, Thank I you. can flash that out, flesh that out a little bit more. So the way that the internet works now is that everything that we do online to a large extent is surveilled and aggregated. Um, the one thing that we don't necessarily have to do in order to access a variety of content and information is provide our ID, our driver's license or, or what have you. Um, but if we have a class of websites that's now required to do that, um, there is this sort of inevitability unless you are so, so, so careful, like as a journalist or as a source for a journalist, that the data that you give to the sites where you have to verify your age will be gobbled up by data brokers and de-anonymized and associated mm -hmm. with your other browsing data, that there will be a profile created on, on you and, um and your habits and what have you it's just it's removing you know another barrier between the like plausible deniability that this person isn't actually you know like leah holland or, or or what have you and um and also there's like this certain amount of inevitability um if one class of websites is required to verify age why not another class of websites and another and another um that sort of creep i think we we're I, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing it in 2025. I think that's that's coming right right down the chutes um, pretty fast. So I, I think um, one thing that that uh, that that leads to is talking about the mechanisms that uh, that are in play to handle this kind of age verification. Um, all right, does anybody here live in France? Okay, I didn't think so. Um, but uh, France tried this um, in uh, 2022, actually. Uh, one of the government agencies in France uh, it, uh, rolled out age verification for adult sites. Um, and it, it went nowhere because uh, another government agency came back and said, no, that the technology isn't there yet. 
Uh, specifically, they said that there was no available method that would provide all uh, reliable verification, complete coverage of the population, and respect for data privacy. Uh, that is still true today. Um, what we are seeing currently is within the adult industry, there's a push for what is called on-device attestation. So this would be something like uh, the, the most familiar form for most people would be if you had a copy of your, uh, your driver's license saved to Apple Wallet. Um, Apple Wallet could send a signal to a website, not with all of your information necessarily, but just a signal that based on what it knows about you, yes, you are over 18. Um, this, this is great for the websites because it's less for them to implement, it's less data for them to store, uh, but it doesn't really get over any of those problems. It creates fewer, more centralized clearing houses for this information. Um, so uh, even though we do have major actors like ALO, the parent company of Pornhub, pushing for this, uh, I think it, it's it's not getting us past uh, any of the major issues. Yeah, we were having one of those, oh no, moments <laughs> in the hallway, hashing out Apple Wallet a little bit of like, all right, so you're pulled over by a cop, your ID is on your iPhone. Do you have to unlock your iPhone and hand your unlocked phone to a cop in order to show them do your, your ID, which then makes that searchable by the cop because you just handed them your open phone? Or alternately, like, do you have to like do some sort of like press it three times and mm -hmm. wave it in the air? And um, and that's the universal way to pull up your ID on any phone. And then that's uh, and then anybody who knows that can pull up your home address. Like, I, uh, I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice, but please do not hand your unlocked phone to a cop. <laughs> and then we get into like, so there's this like there's this techno utopian line that I keep hearing from um, like the decentralized tech crowd, which sounds really good of something similar to what the iPhone is doing um, or would be doing if it were sending a signal that says over 18 boop, 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 or whatever to uh, to Pornhub. But the um, trouble with that is like and 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 so to create like some sort of like self-hosted self-custody wallet of like i have my little thing on my on my device that i control that's encrypted and, and, and encrypted and nobody else can see it and i can just press the button to say tell this website that i'm 18 or or what or what have you um and it's totally secure and it's this it's the signal of digital identity and all of that jazz and um that as France says, that really doesn't exist yet. And the complexity there is something that I'm just highly skeptical of, given the many promises that I've seen um, from 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 that world. And I like appreciate the idealism and the conversations that are being had there. And I think that eventually something like that maybe could be built. But then we have to get back to the premise of like, what are we doing to the people under 18 if we're blocking them from certain sorts of content? Mm -hmm. We are driving them to worse places to be, worse places to get that content, places outside of our jurisdiction. And um, and we're driving people who maybe like need are, are looking to explore their sexuality to less safe places to do that. And uh, and 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 that's more of a society question, I think. But um, I have some strong opinions. So. So you mentioned early on um, that there's a lot of backing for COSA and similar bills um, from very rightfully concerned parents. We live in a world where we, we just had a, we have a massive mental health crisis uh, rolling from the pandemic, et cetera. Um, so like this is coming from, in a lot of cases, it's coming from re very real and substantiated concerns. Um, for the welfare, for the actual welfare of actual kids, yes. Um, so what I'm interested in from that angle, um, taking it from, clearly a lot of it, it's extremely misguided, um, but if you take it on its like youth advocacy sort of, from a youth advocacy angle, 
what kind of parallel efforts are there or do you think could or should there be um, in terms of addressing these issues from the lens of um, child's rights and um, youth liberation? There is so much work being done on this right now. This is a really great question that I feel a little bit inadequate to fully answer. Um, there, I would point to the Inclusive Design Institute, which is doing really amazing papers on that exact topic. Um, I would... One of, the, one of the points that I found most interesting around this, like, true crisis that we do have on our hands is is that statistically we haven't historically measured mental health for youth we haven't measured self-harm and so when we say that we have a crisis now as opposed to the past the numbers that we're comparing um now to the past are vastly different in terms of the breadth of the survey like where the where the data is actually coming from how much data is being collected and of whom how they're asking the questions all of the above um certainly coming out of covid kids are dealing with a different set of uh, like a different set of problems to a certain extent but also part of this crisis that we're facing may just be that like as a society we're reckoning for the first time with how hard it is to be a kid and um and what that means to to me um and and to a lot of the advocates and experts that i talk to is that like we need a radical investment in services for youth and a radical investment and in, and in health care <laughs> <laughs> and, and, nice. and and what these folks actually need to heal and to take care of themselves and we just don't do that in this country we'd rather point to some fucking law um which is so sad uh, i mean i was just i was listening to npr as i was desperately trying to wake up from my nap and be coherent for this i, I did a good <laughs> job i'm like stoked but uh <laughs> and there was this uh, there was an interview with some advocate um who uh from like the larry nasser's sexual assault case talking about the fact that the fbi just never freaking followed through mm -hmm. and so much of this uh these these impacts are the fact that you know the the people that are supposed to quote unquote, protect us or take care of us or what have you, just are not following through on actually doing their freaking jobs and listening to people when they say that they need help and giving and actually having adequate resources to offer. And uh, and I think that we're to, to a large extent with these laws putting. Point trying to point at a computer and say, oh, well, the technology broke it. And I don't think that the technology broke it. I think it's just been broken for a long time and now we see it. Um, that said, there is far more that we can do legislatively. That's just my soapbox. I don't know. Did I, did I get close? You want to take some of that? Yes, that was definitely where I was going and okay. what, I, what kind of uh, information I was interested in. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, not, nothing to add to that, but that was a, a, a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Yeah, that was a great question. Ooh, okay. <laughs> it is now 10 30 p.m. on Friday right. night. We are going hard. Yeah. Um <laughs> so why are these platforms shut down? I think that would be a good mm -hmm. one that we could transition to talk about as more people get up maybe to ask questions or folks go to party with the, <laughs> the Luigi's and the, <laughs> the people in the dinosaur costumes. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so I, I think there um, there are two reasons that the the companies are shutting down in the states that pass these laws. One is that, uh, as we said earlier, the the verification technology isn't really there yet. Um, so, they don't want to be on the hook to totally implement it themselves. Uh, that's a very expensive proposition. Um, and two, I think it, I think it is strategic for them. Um, I think they want to show these states, okay, you you want us to do this. We'll, 
we don't have to play ball with you. Uh, you're not worth it to us. Um, I, I don't know if people like Ken Paxton particularly care um, if Pornhub is no longer available in Texas, but I, I think that that's a big part of the calculation. And again, they, they want to drive the development in a certain direction. And is there a third with liability like with Sesta Fosta here? Or is I, I again not a lawyer and I, I would I would imagine there is that. so speculating. <laughs> I would speculate that uh that yeah, there's a third motivation here, which is very similar to like Sesta Fosta basically said it um that any sort that, that any sort of website that's facilitating um sex work has to like has massive liability if they ever facilitate trafficking and so those websites just shut down the part of 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 the website like that that would serve those communities uh entirely and uh because that was far far easier and less risky to just shut it down completely and boot those users than it was to take on the liability and risk of violating the law and being sued or facing penalties, et cetera. And I would imagine that for these websites with some of these laws, it's a similar question. I thought Scott was here to yell at us about time, but I think he has a question. No, I actually have a question here. So I had heard, I've, I've been hearing about COSA for a long time, but now I've recently heard about COSPA, K-O-S-P-A. So that's a, is that, that's a Kids Online Safety and Privacy Act. And so is that more of a privacy bill or? I, uh, you're saying it's the same bill? No, just another attempt to get around. The, the same old, the same old thing. Um, I would have to phone a friend for that, and I think that they're asleep at this point. So, okay. <laughs> because I, I, I had heard that one of our Georgia senators was involved in that too. So, it seems like it's a little bit of a different approach. So, I was trying to, to, to because I think most of the other laws I've seen in this vein have been a just total dumpster fire. So, mm -hmm. Um, so I was curious as to what the yeah perspective was. Yeah, they generally are a dumpster fire. I mean, for for our part, in addition to like wanting to offer more resources to youth to legitimate to legitimately care for the problems that they're having, we do recognize that these like large tech companies do try to be addictive on purpose, and that that's really insidious and and toxic, and that there are many design features like auto autoplay choices that make these apps more addictive to kids that we could regulate into the netherworld and we would be really really into that um and then we also recognize at the same time that even you know we have we have some protect like some measly privacy protections for people that we know are kids in this country in terms of data collection that we the lack of federal data privacy laws for all of us um, here is the major incentive towards addictive design and surveillance capitalism that um, that leads to creating services that that try to be harmful and addictive on our, on purpose and um, and and that our our priority or like a priority should be to protect all of us and protect kids too from the sort of mass data collection and and that's happening now and the ways that that data is being leveraged to manipulate us to de-anonymize things that we thought were private etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so that's sort of like I, I i can't speak to that specific law um <laughs> but i uh, i can I, I can point to a couple of things that that we could do that would be good for once and I, I think the biggest one is to protect all of us not just kids because kids are inevitably gonna have you know their 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 parent or guardian uh <laughs> step in and say well yeah you can use adult youtube you need it for your research project or there's just there's so many ways that kids are treated like adults online and and that's not gonna stop so let's just treat everyone like they deserve human rights not just kids
Uh, hello. Uh, you mentioned VPNs earlier. How do these age verification laws work with something like that? Like, couldn't a minor in Florida or whichever state just potentially change servers? I mean, how do these laws attempt to deal with something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, they, they don't really do anything. Um, I, I believe, uh, as Leah was suggesting, there, there could be some liability um, for, for the site for uh you know if if it were somehow recorded that they served the content to a minor uh I, I believe that they would be considered uh in any sane legislation to have done their due diligence uh by subscribing to a standard geolocation service um and just looking at the ip address that the user came in via um the, these are not super reliable services but they're industry standard so yes, uh, if you use a VPN and you use a VPN uh, exit in another state that does not have one of these laws or another country for that matter, you should be fine uh, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and in fact, we, we've seen enormous uh, spikes in searches for and downloads of VPNs uh, since the passage of these state laws. It's Once again, it's just you know how the internet works you ever <laughs> you ever been there and it seems like a lot of the the people who are writing these laws maybe haven't <laughs> uh and i think that touches a bit on you know like the 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 why of it again why pass these age verification laws why why have these moral panics about what kids are, are doing online. And it's, and, and it, it, to me, it just comes back to, again, scoring cheap political points. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly difficult to fight back against a law that is purporting to save kids or to help kids or protect kids. Like no politician wants their opponent to run a ad that says, so-and-so wants kids to be able to watch porn without their parents knowing or or what whatever whatever like ridiculous attack ad might might come from that it's very very hard to get legislators even on a federal level to to have have a spine when it comes to bad laws if um if the optics might impact them negatively um and that's rough, uh, and 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 part of the aim of these these laws to when they center on kids is is that exact strategy of I want to shoehorn whatever I want to shoehorn through. I want to take advantage of moral panic and pass something that like is is useless if not actively harmful when we really get down to it, and uh, so that I can say I stop kids in my state from ever being able to access porn and pat, my, pat, pat myself on the back for that is the politician who has a, met, a, a bill that um, for all practical effect is, is just garbage. And that's really sad. That's just a reflection of the state of our politics. Um, and let's, let's steer me somewhere else, Sergio. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, um, I don't know if I have anything more positive to say about the, <laughs> the legislative motivations. I mean, again, I, I think you know, people have, um, have um, people have a lot of bad feelings about pornography, and a lot of those are uh, a, a lot of those are uh, you know are, are honestly uh received right um it, it, it's not all the, this this beautiful puppies and rain uh, well let's not talk about puppies it's not all this this beautiful like rainbows <laughs> and clouds sex positive stuff it, it's, 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 it's like not not good i don't like it um personal and some of it can give uh you know, uh, it would not be how I would encourage a child to learn about the world. That said, we are talking about the entire medium um, that we we don't uh, we don't ban 
all uh, books or all movies or anything like that because some of them are equally terrible or worse. Um, many, uh, uh, as we suggested before, uh, many teens are in the, the position of needing a safe way to explore and figure out their sexuality and having to find uh, parental permission uh, is not going to be safe for everyone. That is a, a tragic fact. And personally, I, I think that that has to be a primary consideration in any law which is designed to protect children. Uh, that's that's just hugely important to me. Yeah, and I would say too that what gets wrapped up in this it, a lot as well is sex education that there's there's many kids who don't really get one mm -hmm. uh and that some of the work that's happening on the websites that might fall under this bill would be websites that just teach you about how to have sa safe sex stis pregnancy i could very easily see these bills being manipulated or interpreted to include websites on reproductive health care um mm -hmm. overall uh i um like try try finding a decent video of how to do a breast exam on youtube have fun it's really sad uh and yeah I, and i just think that my overall point there that we've already touched on is that the mission creep is inevitable and i, I do want to point out though that like, I feel like we panned digital identity wholesale, perhaps, <laughs> at the start of this. And, uh, and and then maybe that was a little bit harsh. Um, there was a, a couple of weeks ago, I met a, um, a couple of groups that are doing some really amazing work with, with, with digital identity and um, for uh, traditionally undervalued communities like migrant workers. There is this uh, there is this group called Entidad that is working on doing digital identity for a migrant farm worker so that their their papers and information can follow them so they can access services like healthcare whether they're picking strawberries in California or picking apples in Washington throughout their travels up and down and that having that sort of constant identity and and and, and medical records for the um, the like not nonprofits and other community groups that that serve them um, because those are the only services that they can access because they they don't have papers um, is is incredibly valuable and important and something that like that group intends to grow into uh, also a system whereby the the workers can actually report on their employers whether or not they're being paid mm -hmm. fairly working conditions etc so that we can. Um, better know how these extremely um, <laughs> marginalized and undervalued people uh, uh, are tr are treated as they as as they pick our food and what have you. Um, and then there was another one uh, called the Rohingya Project, which works with the Rohingya people um, from Burma who have been systematically displaced and genocided by the Burmese government. And I think that they've been denied birth certificates since the 1980s. And so these are millions of people who have been driven into refugee camps with very little hope of escape or opportunity who are starting to get the um, the papers that they've never had in order to apply for benefits in order to apply for anything because institutions are built only to serve people who have some sort of identity on paper and that's incredibly um limiting for people who have never never had that or been systematically denied that because they're they're there's there's a government that's trying to erase them uh and these seem like really worthy causes to find a new solution for but a 17 year old who wants to watch porn in utah is not a rohingya refugee in bangladesh like 
<laughs> and 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 to treat them as similar, I think, does a disservice to both communities mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the technological solutions um, that might be needed. We've also seen some alternate proposals to uh, digital IDs. Um, they're much, they're even worse. Uh, there, there's not a lot of promise there. Uh, the, the other proposals that I'm aware of involve uh, doing attestation through things like credit agencies or uh, facial analysis, which I'm sure would be uh, perfectly accurate and not creepy at all. Yeah, there's a like, whole crypto project, like, we'll give you crypto if you let us scan your eyeball. Oh, with the orb? Is that the yeah, the, yeah orb. the orb. The orb. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, no. No. It, like, it, it was like this whole wave of, like, biometric identity verification is the future. Biometric face scams. Biometric voice scams. It was just, it was so fast that we went from, like, this is how people are identifying themselves to, like, Turn off the voice verification with your bank people because that's how you're going to lose all your money. Uh, so that sort of glossy eyed solution, like solutionism or marketing for, you know, I think that actually is the right term. That sort of marketing hype and storytelling about what technology can do and solve is, I think, actively harmful mm -hmm. in these these sorts of situations and that's another good thing to name though is that and i think that it's kind of been implied in the conversation so far is that there are so many crappy tech companies that are just foaming at the mouth for government contracts to do age verification or anything tangentially associated with this stuff and their technologies are usually really terrible um they are like like ter terrible for users don't do what they say they're going to do are some sort of black box of like IP rights, non-disclosure agreements and, and, and whatever mm -hmm. else that makes it impossible for the public to audit what's actually going on within the software. And, um, and, and it's also really, really opaque for the people who are using it in terms of like, I think about other surveillance technologies like license plate readers or, facial recognition systems or parking apps or, or, or what have you and that um, or even like library contracts with ebook apps like Libby or Hoopla or what have you that many of those contracts and the actual terms of what can or can't be done with the data that that third party vendor collects are um, trade secrets. So there's actually not an ability for the public to audit at all what's being done with the information that's collected by these third parties. Um, and that means it may be being sold directly into data brokers. Um, well, I, I like to say may, cause like maybe like, I don't know, maybe some of these people have like morals or respect for their fellow human beings <laughs> they could be out there you know uh, <laughs> but it's uh it, it's just it's rough going like there's there, there's a lot of money in in, in age verification contracts mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of companies lobbying and chomping at the bit to get it um and to pass these sort of laws too, so that they can be the ones that sit between all of us and all all the porn. So yeah, on, on the uh, continuing with the, the legal aspect, um, just again, big, huge red flashing. I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think it's super obvious. And hopefully, if anybody else here has ever read the um, it's called the uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, maybe it'll be obvious to you uh, that there, there are some First Amendment issues at play here. Um, so uh, that that's still really up in the air with these state laws. Um, the Texas law uh, looks like it's going to go before the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but in the meantime, just... Uh, less than a week ago, I believe, um, 
somewhere around that time frame, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals uh, decided that with that pending, the Indiana law could go into effect, um, which doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it, it does, at least from, from a very amateur court watcher perspective, kind of suggest that they're not thinking that the Supreme Court is about to just smack this down very quickly. Um, so things are very much up in the air as far as that goes. I, I would not hold my breath for a judicial fix from this Supreme Court on this issue. Uh, again, not a lawyer. Don't don't uh, don't quote me on any of the the legal aspects, but that is where we are, to the best of my understanding. Yeah, um, I think that we could explore a little bit. We could go deeper on mission creep. What, mm -hmm. what we we could make some make some predictions. If you want? Uh, That's very doom and gloom of me. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I mean. What what would be a hopeful uh, a hopeful a mission hopeful, creep yeah, like, of age verification? I, I don't know about okay. yeah. You want to come <laughs> up to the mic just so that the recording can hear you, if you don't mind. Thanks. I mean, a hopeful one maybe they could argue that ads targeting children are unhealthy for them, so that might be one. I like that kind of a a little bit of jujitsu. Yeah, I mean, ads targeting children, ads should just not really, like, any ad that uses a child's personal data or preferences to try to manipulate them into buying or wanting something is pretty gross. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, we have some kind of sort of protections around that, but also not really. Um, and that that gets right back into the whole federal data privacy battle um where if the essentially the um the end goal is to cut off the supply to make it impossible to collect and sell all that data on all of us so that they can't use it to try and manipulate us and just specifically or and, and especially people who are really vulnerable to man manipulation like kids um that would be the ideal uh and of course, the the reason that at this point it's so impossible to get any sort of meaningful federal data privacy legislation is, again, that there is so much money <laughs> in that data. Um, I was there's a bill we had a panel on it uh, yesterday called the uh, the delete act that passed recently in California. And um, there's a federal version as well. And what that would be is like a one click opt out for data brokers, like a data broker do not call list. And uh, that would be awesome. Uh, the fight to get that done in California was particularly hard one. I think the organizer that I was talking to out there, the quote was, they had more money than God. And <laughs> <laughs> and I think on a on a federal level, uh, a bill that would meaningfully actually stop the data gobbling money machine um, would would face extraordinary opposition. Like with the the there was a, a version of that sort of data broker opt out in the latest privacy bill to fail um, called APRA American Privacy Rights Act, and that one uh, yeah it had like. Data brokers should have an opt out for everyone, and but but we we don't want to have it centralized, so it's one click. You still have to go and opt out from the endlessly mushrooming list of five hundred plus data brokers that exist. So if you go to everyone and you opt out, then your data can stay down, and unless the data broker pays a penalty with a maximum of five thousand dollars a year. Uh, and, and so that was so, <laughs> and, and like the cost to comply with the legislation was like orders of magnitude higher than paying $5,000 a year in a fine. And we, you know, I, I, and we more or less know that if that's, that's the fine that you've got on, um, on the radar, that is definitely the pro product of some lobbyists making a 
uh, of money back recommendation. Yeah, I, say. I, I think we see we see time and time again in legislation or any kind of rulemaking, even something like maybe a code of conduct. You might use it at some you know place like Dragon Con. If you're if you're making things harder for uh, for the honest people and not really changing the behavior of the bad actors, uh, then you're you're not doing any good. And that's that's just the pattern that we've seen again and again in I think all of these laws, except maybe the Delete Act and APRA that we talked about tonight, uh, COSA, SESTA, FOSTA, and these state level laws. Um, they're they're making things harder for people who you know maybe are, are trying to educate themselves, trying to explore the sexuality, maybe just want sexual gratification that is part of being human. Um, and they are not significantly making things any harder for people who are really uh, carrying out the worst exploitation that we do see on these sites. Yep, just driving it elsewhere. Um, but I will point out that Gosa didn't pass because we organized like hell. The Earn It Act didn't pass because sex workers organize like hell. And um, and there is the ability to scare the crap out of these legislators or enough of them. Like that's that's often the theory that we apply at Fight for the Future. It's like we, what we ask ourselves is how can we make doing the right thing less scary than doing the wrong thing? It's it's this this very interesting mix of shadow boxing and um and 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 lever and and like leveraging the power of impacted communities um and getting them um getting them in front of of, of legislators in a way that they can't that's undeniable and um that's been working for us we've been able to make these bills incredibly controversial and uh and more and more now people when you say it's a save the kids bill uh even to your average joe on the street they've heard something about these save the kids bills <laughs> maybe they aren't really about saving the kids and uh and so i see these like well i see these sort of laws and and these sorts of challenges is very much a generational thing uh and 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 that you know even if you know, some states you have to use a VPN to watch porn if you don't want to give them your ID. Ooh. Um, that that ultimately we are getting more educated and um and and increasing the understanding of how the internet works and how these legislators are failing us uh, in a way that'll lead to more accountability and and better laws. I do have a fair amount of hope, um, and. And in the meantime, we can just throw so much shade. That's fun too. Uh, oh, and that's time. We're, we're at time, and what better note to end on than throwing shade? Yeah. And in that spirit, I have stickers up here. I have glitter possum digital security as community care stickers. I've got various other glitter stickers and some zines. So anybody who wants to come say hi or grab a sticker, please, please do.